So welcome back to the Fairly Lame Podcast. My name is Dom, and as always, we go over the world's feel-good, uh, environmental, conservation, sustainability-related news stories, not just here in Australia, but the world, uh, every Monday, 3 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time at the moment. But yeah, hopefully you guys have had an incredible Christmas period. This is going out. I actually don't know when this is going out. Let's see. This is going out on the... 2nd of January. So hopefully, you know, you're starting your New Year's resolutions. I personally don't hate them. I mean, whatever gets people, you know, up and about working towards their goals. I don't have any this year, but you know, if you have any New Year's resolutions, let me know down in the comments below how you're going to, you know, work towards them, what plans you have in place, whether it's the gym or starting something new, anything like that. Yeah, be sure to let us know. But then a quick announcement before we get into today's story. So last on the 28th, right, we dropped our first episode of Inside the Flames, which we're calling like the little behind the scenes, I guess, uh, podcast, right? So it's uh, Flames because fairly lame flame kind of thing. So they're dropping randomly, to be honest with you. At this moment, we dropped one on the 28th, and then I also filmed another one. So that will be going out probably next week. It will be a Wednesday, and we'll let you know when it comes out. Uh, and yes, yeah, so that's just going to be a look behind the curtain kind of thing, you know, what I'm thinking about, very reflective, very open, to be honest, too. I don't know if in a few years' time this stuff's going to get me in trouble or whatever, but, um, yeah, no, it's good. It's kind of like if we went, you know, go get a coffee on a nice Sunday morning, couple espressos, whatever, how it would be, you know, just catching up, where my head's at, um, and, yeah, this one or the next one that's coming out will be a bit more of a reflection of the year because, uh, yeah, we've been doing Fairly Lane for just under a year. I think I started in... February, I think it was February 20, around 24, I want to say, so just under a year, so we set some goals, um, but yeah, mainly just about what we've learned and whatnot, and the first one, I think the first one was mainly just talking about the podcast, a few things I want to improve, anyway, yeah, very candid, not planned whatsoever, it's kind of just like whatever comes to my mind in the moment, but hopefully it's enjoyable, um, and yeah, it'll be definitely good to look back on it in a few years' time to see where my head was at, but for today's story. So the first one we have. Oh, also, as always, all the timestamps for all these stories are down in the bio, as well as all the links if you want to go have a read in your own time as well. But today's first topic, vaccinating frogs against the deadly chytrid fungus. Is it necessary? How effective is it? Where is it being used? We'll go over all of that. And then, you know, rolling off nicely from that is Canberra's National Parks get seven boot cleaning stations. Uh, so, you know, why they're useful, why they're being implemented, what are they trying to stop the spread of, all that good stuff. Then, uh, oh, and also what you can do even if you can't access a station, for example, if you're, you know, out in some country town, whatever, or even in Melbourne and there aren't a, uh, or a city and there aren't boot cleaning stations, they've got a couple tips on there about what you can do, you know, make your own little station, clean your own boots. Uh, then space-based solar farms from robots building massive solar arrays to beaming down power as microwaves. We'll have a look at how effective and realistic this could be. Next, we have the value of degraded, you know, quote unquote forests. Are they still valuable? Do they need to be protected? Or once they're being logged or selectively logged in this case, should they be forgotten about? Then how indoor plants can legitimately improve your well-being at home. We have a couple interesting uh, scientific studies, some cool percentages coming out of that. And finally, gene editing to speed up the reproduction rates of rare trees. Is it playing God or are we in a race against time? So that's what we're going over in today's episode of the Fairly Lame Podcast. We'll try to keep it a bit shorter because last week we went for about an hour and I feel like that's just too long. Hopefully we'll be aiming for around... 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, I think, going forward. Today, we've got a few stories. We've got six stories, uh, but, you know, we'll see how we go. As always, as well, before we get into it, we have a screen recording set up. So over on YouTube, if you want to read along with us, see some nice pictures. We're also going to be listening or watching to a video. It doesn't go for too long, like two minutes. It's kind of like the old uh, classroom, you know what I mean? When you go to school and uh, the old substitute teacher brings out those old, what was it, like click, not clickbait, Click, click view, click view, view, click view movies you'd watch when you had substitute teacher. Let me know if you know what I'm talking about. So, vaccinating frogs may or may not protect them against a pandemic, but it does provide another option for conservation. 
So amphibians, for example, have been undergoing a global panzootic, the animal version of a pandemic for decades. In the late 1990s, researchers identified the amphibian chytrid fungus, which causes often lethal disease chytridiomycosis uh, as a probable culture, culprit rather, behind frog and salamander declines and extinctions from Australia to Central America and elsewhere that began 10, 20 or even 30 years ago. So scientists have found this pathogen on every continent that amphibians inhabit and the extensive global amphibian trade has likely spread lethal, highly lethal tra- uh, strains around the world. The amphibian chytrid fungus is widespread in some geographic regions and, like the virus which causes COVID-19, it can mutate rapidly and take new forms that cause varying disease severity. So, conservation, translocation, pretty common. I'm sure most of us had heard about it. It's literally just moving organisms to either uh, re-establish populations that have gone extinct, supplement existing ones, or establish new ones in areas where the species was not previously present. However, when the amphibian chytrid fungus is prevalent in the landscape, frogs are likely to get sick again, hampering the success of translocations. So to avoid the setbacks of the disease, researchers are using a tool often employed against human pandemics, inoculation akin to vaccines. And so, you know, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of, conservation translocation coming out of breeding programs or healthy populations but from my knowledge mostly breeding programs when they release animals into an area which may have uh higher numbers of whether it's invasive species or again diseases and they're just trying to top up that population rather than remove the threat because maybe they can't remove the threat um and then there might be issues if they try to remove that population in terms of if they try to bring that population into you know, a secure location, maybe that could cause some issues for the ecosystem as well. And from my knowledge, most animals which are a part of translocation go or undergo some examination, some medical examination to make sure they're not carrying diseases. But I think, I don't think that involves vaccination, at least not to my knowledge. So in our recent study, uh, my research team and I inoculated threatened California red leg frogs against chytrid fungus before translocation by exposing them to the chytrid fungus in a laboratory. We wanted to see if we could activate their immune system uh, and give them an f- advantage over the fungus once they're released. So they collected some frogs and then they bathed uh, 20 in a cocktail of four live active strains of the fungus Uh, And then after three weeks, they were given a bath of antifungal to halt the infection. Then another 40 frogs uh, were not uh, exposed to the fungus, were then given a bath with the antifungal, just, you know, control, get a clean slate, all that good stuff. And then they re-exposed the 20 uh, previously infected frogs to the fungus a second time, while 20 previously uninfected frogs were exposed to the fungus for the first time. We wanted to see how frogs with a second infection, namely those that were quote-unquote vaccinated, compared with those that were only infected once. So they said what we found was surprising. 35% of the frogs infected only once successfully cleared the infection without vaccination or an antifungal drug. This suggests that they have some measure of innate immunity because there wasn't, you know, a 100% fatality rate, right? And then uh, frogs infected a second time had a 31% lower rate of infection than those that were only infected once. So this suggests that the vaccine-like treatment also works by stimulating adaptive immunity, meaning their immune system learned to recognize the fungus from their first exposure and fight it off more efficiently. None of the frogs died from their fungal inspe- uh, infections, which is amazing to hear. So before they were released into the wild, the frogs were treated with an antifungal drug and then monitored after their release. And interestingly, they found there was no difference in the disease burden between the frogs that had been quote-unquote vaccinated and then the ones that hadn't been, raising the question on whether is a vaccine actually, you know, worthful, worthwhile going through with it if there isn't any benefits? Or is this just due to it could potentially be the frog species, it could be the certain strains of chytrid fungus, it could even be the location, 
who knows? Could be a whole mix of things. But for a bit of background, for those who may not have come across chytrid fungus before, I'm pretty sure it's the disease. Like, you might have seen videos online or whatever about, like, these zombie frogs, and they've got, like, things growing out of them. I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so this is on the New South Wales government's website. So they said, scientists think the decline and disappearance of some frog species in Australia and overseas may be partly due to a disease called chytrid fungus. It attacks the frog's skin that have keratin in them. Uh, since frogs use their skin for respiration, it makes it difficult for the frog to breathe. The fungus also damages the nervous system, affecting the frog's behavior. And also, important, this is something I didn't know because as a kid, I had... Uh, uncle and auntie right at their house they had a pool or they have a pool they still do and it they didn't clean it or whatever because it was like this old thing anyway and so there'd be all these frogs in there and so i used to catch them all the time put them in uh little like uh aquariums whatnot and then take them up to this dam to release them right i didn't know that it was harmful touching them so i'd like pick them out and like have them like sitting on you for a bit you weren't like messing with them too much but you're just like touching them apparently that's not a good thing because they do yeah respire through their skin and it can actually be very toxic to touch them. Especially, I think sunscreen's really bad, but even just the oils and stuff that you have on your hands can harm uh, frogs. And so, if you, this is how you can identify a frog that may have been infected with chytrid fungus. So, you know, you can kind of know what you're looking for. So, a sick frog may have discolored skin, uh, be sloughing or peeling on the outside layers of its skin. Uh, sit out in the open, not protecting itself by hiding, which is going back to the, the affecting the frog's behavior part, be sluggish slash have no appetite and have its hind legs splayed out away from itself and its body can even become rigid with its back legs trailing behind. So the chytrid fungus is probably transferred by direct contact between frogs and tadpoles or through exposure to infected water. The disease may not kill frogs immediately, but they can swim or hop to others er, other areas before they die, spreading the fungus to new ponds and streams. This means it is very important not to move frogs from one area to another. Wet or muddy boots and tyres, fishing gear, camping gear, gardening or frog survey equipment may also contribute to the spread of the disease. So what can we do to help stop the spread? So, only touch frogs when it's absolutely necessary. Uh, use disposable gloves, gloves rather, uh, and sterile equipment. Clean and dry all equipment uh, and wet or muddy footwear before and after visiting frog sites. And then never move a frog from one area to another and carry cleaning utensils. And if you, ha if you find a sick frog, most importantly, place the frog into a container without directly touching it. And then if it's still alive, ring the frog watch helpline for an opinion on whether the frog is sick or whether it's likely to survive transportation if the frog's dead uh put it into a plastic bag uh et al so there's also been a very interesting uh discovery that some of australia's frogs are starting to develop their own resistance to the kitchen fungus which kind of supports what they saw over in Yos in the yosemite valley which was over uh, which was where this study was conducted, where they've got some innate uh, immunity and they also have adaptive immunity as well. And so we're seeing in Australia, the old natural selection and whatnot, the frogs that have a lower or a poor immune system, whatever, aren't as you know well-equipped to survive a fungus. They're dying out and they're not being able to breed. So not the whole species dying out but the individuals within the species which aren't as equipped to survive this could be dying out and so then the ones that are better equipped or more adapted to survive this are then making it to reproductive stage and then that's how we get these changes but then you know staying on the topic of stopping the spread of pathogens so the act government and parks act have recently installed seven new boot scrub stations at popular trailheads across namaji national park so walking shoes can potentially carry seeds and pathogens into the park, so these boot scrubbing stations will help to keep weeds out and our native plants healthy. Something as simple as scrubbing your boots when entering and leaving the Magi can help manage biosecurity risks and protect our native flora and fauna from disease and pests that can impact their habitats. And so I've got a couple of pictures here because for some reason I couldn't find a picture online about these stations. I just saw them when I went out to the incredible Gibraltar Falls 
uh, out, uh, I guess, west of Canberra. Highly recommend. If you're ever in the beautiful Australian Capital Territory, do yourself a favor. Go out to Gibraltar Falls and the Tibby Miller. It'll change your life. Anyway, so I normally go there every time I get back home, just for a bit of a drive out. Best, right? It's the best. Um, and then I noticed this. So this is the boot cleaning station. Or actually, is that not picking up? It wasn't. One second. So this is a picture of the boot cleaning station. And so it's pretty hectic. Like, it's pretty full on. I think we had a second picture here as well. So, uh, yeah. So you're entering a dieback free area. So clean footwear before entry. So there's a few there's a few steps here. you got to pump. you got to scrub footwear, pump the handle, spray heel to toe. Um, and so what are pathogens? Pathogens are disease-causing organisms that can harm nature. Examples include Phytophthora dieback and the chytrid frog fungus, which we just mentioned. So many can live in soil, water, and organic material. Bushwalking can spread pathogens. To minimize the risk, clean footwear, avoid moist conditions, and keep to the track. And so, as I said, there's seven of these stations in Canberra and some national parks, not just in Australia, but all over the world, are starting to incorporate them. Here's a bit of background information on, you know, why they're necessary, because it wouldn't be all that cheap to install these. Um, and it seems kind of surprising, because you see, like, whenever you're travelling through customs, like, I went overseas a couple times for footy tours, for rugby tours and whatever, and cricket tours and all that, so you had to clean your boots like really well to make sure you're not spreading any seeds and stuff back into the country. And so in airports, it's kind of expected. But even just national parks, it you know, when you're in the same state, you can be walking 10 metres away and not have to spray your boots. But then in certain areas, you have to. And so at least at Gibraltar Falls when I was, this was to try and combat uh, eucalypt dieback. And so we'll have a bit of a read about what it was. It sounds like eucalypt dieback can be caused by a few things. Again, I'm not a plant expert. I'm not an expert in really anything. But uh, what I read is that dieback is kind of like when the trees start dropping all their leaves and it can be caused by different stresses. And here are some examples of what can cause this dieback in eucalypt species. Because again, it seems like it can be, can be caused by a variety of things. So examples of two-factor dieback events include those that are caused by the combination of drought and fungal shoot pathogens, drought and heat, drought and fire, and waterlogging and Phytophthora uh, cinnamomy root disease, among other things. And then this other website on the New South Wales government said it's been associated with overabundant Philids, psyllids, I don't know, psyllids and bell miners. I think they're just bugs. I think... I'm pretty sure it's it's got to do with overgrazing of bugs as well. So, a variety of things. And so, like, I'm guessing because Gibraltar Falls, it's a, you know, a waterfall, bit wet, whatever. So, I'm assuming in that situation, it could be due to water. Oh, no, nah, but it's not waterlogged soil. There was a fire there recently. So, maybe it is got to do with drought and fire because there was drought previously. And then maybe now, once these trees are starting to regrow, maybe they're more susceptible to fire top thrower. So this is on uh, greatwalks.com. And so they said, uh, it's important to keep our hiking gear clean, not just because it helps it last longer, but because it helps reduce biosecurity issues in the bush. So myrtle rust, Phytophthora cinnamomy, weed seeds, and other hitchhikers can get stuck on our clothes or the mud on our boots and be accidentally carried in or out of the area we're hiking in. These hitchhikers have the potential to completely change the landscape and its ecology by killing off or outcompeting native species. And then, so as we've talked about, these stations aren't everywhere. So here are some tips from Walking South Australia about how we can stop the spread, even if we don't have the luxury of one of these boot cleaning stations. So, uh, how to keep your footwear clean. Bushwalkers are encouraged to carry a hygiene kit in their backpacks to keep footwear clean. A hygiene kit should contain a hard brush to clean footwear, spray bottle of disinfectant, methylated spirits, or a household bleach diluted to one part bleach with four parts water in regards to the type of disinfectant. And then on how to clean your boots. So if a hygiene station isn't located on your walk, select a hard, well-drained site for boot cleaning. 
Remove all soil and plant material from one boot at a time using the brush. Disinfect the entire sole using the spray bottle before placing the boot on the ground. Allow the sole of the boot for, to dry for approximately one minute. Step forward to avoid recontaminating your footwear and repeat steps two to six on the other boot and finish by disinfecting the uh, ground on which you carried out the cleaning and the brush. There you go. So we all play a part. Nice, simple steps. Good thing to remember too. Just, yeah, all do our part. Because even driving on the highway, you can see when you're coming into New South Wales or coming into Victoria from New South Wales, there'll be signs about no grape or no like vineyard equipment and stuff like this allowed past this section because there's some disease. We learned about this back in uh, geography. There's some disease in the roots of uh, grapes, I guess, vines, grape vines uh, that they're trying to spread or trying to stop spread and all sorts of issues. And yeah, you see it a lot with agricultural equipment, actually. Now that I think about it, driving down the highway, heaps of it. Um, but for our next story, so space-based solar power, how it works and why now it's being considered. So putting solar panels in space may seem unnecessary when there's still so much room on our roofs, but this vision of the future has powerful backers. Millions of dollars are being ploughed into the concept of vast photovoltaic islands in the sky. And photovoltaic just means uh, something that converts light into electricity. Um, so the US, UK and Chinese governments are funding research while the European Space Agency has approved a three-year study named Solaris. So, clean energy beamed from above. So, space is the ideal place for a solar panel. With the right orbit, the sun is always shining. Plus, without an atmosphere absorbing and scattering the solar radiation, the sunlight is brighter and the photovoltaic cells gather more energy. In theory, space-based solar panels can provide non-intermittent clean energy at a similar scale to nuclear power. And apparently there was also a little presentation. If you if you follow over on TikTok and Instagram and subscribe on YouTube, just put that out there, at fairly lame underscore, uh, I've got a bit of a short form content where we touch on this. And one of the videos behind me is from a presentation where it actually compared, compared the price of space-based solar to nuclear, to coal maybe. And yes, space-based was a lot cheaper than nuclear as well. So the two main challenges are getting solar panels into space and then getting the energy down here. These challenges are partly economic. One reason that space-based solar panels is back on the agenda is a plummeting cost per kilogram of launching payloads into space, largely due to uh, reusable rockets. The figure has fallen nearly 20-fold in two decades. So to generate a useful amount of energy, each orbital solar farm would have to be many times larger than the current largest structure in space, the International Space Station. The solar energy collected by the satellites would be converted into microwaves and then beamed to rectifying antennas or rectennas on Earth, which in turn would convert them into electricity. This energy beam won't fry birds that cross its path, experts say, as the intensity at the center would be about 3% as strong as a typical microwave oven. And so the process of wirelessly transmitting electricity, while technically feasible, is very inefficient. Most of the collected energy is lost in the process, but according to two cost-benefit studies commissioned by the ESA, that's not necessarily a deal-breaker. So long as just 10% of the power that falls on the panel is actually delivered to the grid, space-based solar panels can be economically viable. It won't be cheaper than rooftop solar or wind power, but it could be cheaper than intermittent renewables plus storage. So, uh, space-based solar can then be dispatched on a continental scale, scale rather, which could you know, help address the point of Cost benefit, cost benefit analysis. I oh, know economic analysis, vi vi economic viability. I guess one solar power satellite could deliver power this morning to Melbourne to the Great Fairly Lame Studios. This evening, that exact same solar power satellite could turn its attention to morning in India. The power generated by the satellite can be transmitted to any city within the line of sight that has the appropriate rectenna. An orbital slot that can see Australia can also see India, China, and Southeast Asia, Japan, and Korea. That band of slots above uh, serves 60% of the world's population. 
And so I had a couple notes here from the short form video because this all sounds very interesting. There's a lot to learn about. Uh, but just quickly, so um, touching on the microwave point. So microwave, you know, it doesn't sound the best. It does sound a bit deadly, but they say it would be transmitted at a frequency to not cause any harm or to be carcinogenic, which means it would be less intense than sunlight. Uh, and then yet yeah, so only 10% of the electricity would have to make it to the other end to be economically viable, but then it can be sold anywhere in the world. So they kind of touched on it here anywhere, saying that solar power could be dispatchable on a continental scale. Also means it can be sold to heaps of countries. You know, like it said down the bottom here, that solar power above Australia could be sold to 60% of the world's population, which could be super beneficial for the companies operating these solar arrays in the bloody space but then also help the energy crisis of these poorer nations as well and then there was also a very interesting idea uh in one of the videos i was watching and it said uh instead of transmitting uh microwaves it could transmit energy as a light laser and reflect this onto planes or ships using reflections from other solar arrays to provide energy even in the night so I'm not sure what would happen during storms, you know, if a, a plane is covered by clouds, if it just can't fly then, or if somehow this laser is able to penetrate through the clouds. But that was a very interesting idea, saying that the planes would need a battery for liftoff and, uh, what's the other one? Landing. But then during the flight, they could be tracked almost with a solar panel or with a, a laser up to the bloody solar array in space. So very interesting there's a lot going on. Uh, definitely want to watch. I mean, it sounds like, I think they said it's been talked about since the 70s, maybe. Since, uh, yeah, since the 70s. And it could finally be here. But yeah, it sounds like a great idea, especially if the solar power would be more intense up there and again, constant. So then maybe 10% of the energy captured is still a pretty good amount if it is more intense and because it is constant. I don't know, definitely one to look out for. So my beloved listeners, before we get into the next story, please make sure to head over to Instagram, TikTok, YouTube to subscribe, follow all that good stuff at fairly lame underscore post my top environmental news stories from each and every day, both as carousel posts, share a heap of wholesome content to the story as well, cute animal videos, cute foxes, bloody yipping and yahoo and all this great stuff, otters cuddling their babies so they don't float away, the best, right? Please make sure to do that. Be much appreciated. But back to the feel-good news. So for our next story, tropical forests ravaged by logging can still have thriving ecosystems. Log forests in Borneo have more abundant birds and mammals than pristine forests, showing that conservationists should still try to protect these habitats. So there'll be a bit of comparison between here and the coast because I did my honours project looking at... Uh, coastal regions, hinterland here in Australia. And so there's some nice uh, comparisons to be drawn. But so tropical forests degraded by logging may be far richer in animal and plant life than we thought. Only around 30% of the world's tropical forests remain pristine. Most have been used for selective logging and are labelled degraded, though ecologists have been unsure precisely how timber extraction changes their ecosystem. And the first little comparison... 30% of the world's tropical forests remain pristine. That was, I don't know if impressive is the right word. It was more than I thought, considering coastal ecosystems. There was a study that came out in 2021 saying that there, there are zero pristine coastal ecosystems in the world. So 30%, I mean, it's better than the coast, that's for sure. But so to address this and, you know, to calculate the value of these degraded ecosystems, a group of Oxford researchers estimated the population density of bird and mammal species. They then used the body mass of these animals to calculate the energy flow in both pristine and degraded forests, which reflects total energy consumption across the food chain. You can think of energy flow as a measure of health or vitality of an ecosystem. They found that birds and mammals in logged forests consume 2.5 times the energy they consume in pristine forests. The total weight of birds and mammals living in logged forests was 144% and 231% higher. The 231% was for mammals. And genuinely, or maybe not obviously, I get, maybe not obviously either, but you might question, well, is this just because 
logged forest, there are all these invasive species coming in. Like, for example, maybe a whole heap of rabbits are coming in and they're making up this biomass, eating heaps of grass, right? But apparently this wasn't the case as the boost in life didn't result from generalist birds and mammals taking over the disturbed forest after specialist species were wiped out, which have occurred when Malaysian forests were converted into palm oil plantations. So nearly all of the species found in the old growth forests were also found in the disturbed forests and most had higher population density. So degraded tropical forests aren't prioritized in conservation efforts as much as pristine jungles and it's easier for governments and companies to convert them into agriculture, to convert degraded forests into agriculture as they're assumed to be less valuable. Um, this study shows that this is actually quite a dangerous idea as many of these degraded forests are just as vibrant, even more vibrant than old growth forests. But importantly, uh, these findings don't mean that, it, that logged forests are superior. Due to the loss of many large trees, degraded forests have less overall biomass and absorb less carbon than pristine forests. They also aren't as helpful in the fight against climate change and worse at other key functions like generating rain. So they said that the broad term of degraded needs to be reconsidered, uh, and in terms of ecology, those log forests are not lost. They're holding vast amount of ecology, biodiversity, and ecological function. And so not to get too much into my honours project, but, you know, shout out. You can go watch it. We've got a little playlist on uh, YouTube for it. But for my project, we found something very similar that we looked at three bays down here in Victoria out in southern central Gippsland across a gradient of modification from what we called highly modified to pretty much pristine, but it wasn't pristine because nothing is pristine for coastal regions, right? And we found that all of them pretty much, like the degree of modification didn't really have an impact on our species. And so one of our recommendations, or I guess findings, was that the degree of, modif like even in modified and degraded coastal habitats, key native species were able to persist. And then that can be a dangerous result depending on how you interpret it. Because then maybe people go, oh, okay, well, if we can degrade these habitats here and there, we can, you know, move farming closer, do this, do that and they still function, then why don't we just do that? Like, if it doesn't impact, if it doesn't significantly impact the ecosystems, why don't we just make as much use of them for for humans as we can if they still serve animals? But then I guess the counterpoint is that, well, there's going to be a threshold at some point. For example, uh, again, using coastal regions, the Gold Coast isn't going to be as biodiverse uh, or as important for biodiversity as... Uh, the the bays that we were looking at just because at the Gold Coast the hinterlands pretty much completely removed or it is completely removed in some areas and so there is a degree of modification which again this study might not have examined either and in my study we didn't visibly see a threshold because we just because yeah we didn't see a, a, any evidence of the impact of uh, habitat modification and then you know plants are incredible you know we're going to protect our forests but then Plants in your home, apparently also very beneficial for our well-being. But this brings us to our next story about how plants inside and out can promote comfort at home. So creating a livable environment is important. There are many different elements to this, such as temperature, humidity, air quality, acoustics, the view from your windows, uh, and more all play a part in how comfortable you feel inside your home. So plants and their role in, I guess, thermal comfort. So large leafy plants placed indoors on a south-facing or north-facing window here in Australia can provide shade and reduce heating from outside uh, sunlight when you don't want to, you know, you don't want to close the blinds all day, you know what I mean? But then they can also cool the air around them slightly through the warmest months as they transpire. And this can help in both winter and summer to keep humidity within the human comfort zone of around 30 to 60%. And then they also touch on how plants can improve air quality, as some studies showed around by 25%. Plants are also helpful to you know improve uh, acoustic comfort, as they term it here, whether it's echoes or it might be street noise as well if you plant trees you know if you have a hedge in front of your house you cut down the noise from the street also plants and a sense of safety and calm this is something i hadn't thought of but it has been shown in numerous studies that being around greenery and plants helps us to feel calmer and reduce stress 
We intrinsically feel calmer in natural environments and surrounding ourselves with indoor plants and outside can therefore help us feel safe and at peace. And then there's this article over on the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald from the University of Technology in Sydney. And they did a study on this and it was very interesting uh, because, I don't know, you kind of see though, everyone knows someone that has a room just littered with plants, right? Plants as far as the eye can see and it's like, oh, you're one of those people. Like, no judgment, but like, you're one of those. Interesting. Um, but there actually is some science behind it. Like, these people, are they're geniuses. They're onto something. So, the report highlights that five or more plants in a room leads to people feeling healthier and happier while simply adding one medium-sized plant to a medium-sized room improves air quality by up to 25%. A University of Technology uh, study provided measurable evidence on the effects of indoor plants on occupants' mood states and feelings of well-being. They found plants brought a 37% reduction in tension and anxiety, a 58% reduction in depression, and a 44% reduction in anger and hostility. Furthermore, the simple mutually giving relationship between a plant and its human caretaker fosters positive feelings of confidence as you're responsible for a plant's well-being and keeping it alive, if you can keep it alive. This is a powerful complement to your holistic self-care and mindfulness practice as keeping a plant alive symbolizes an open heart, creates positive emotions, and brings you naturally into the present moment while fully embracing your senses. So there you go. Fill your room with plants. We've got a few down here. Not as much as I wish I had, just because I had real scrappy ones. Like you, you'd, you know, find them places that you'd be given them and nothing matched. They're all in like shit um, pots and stuff. So we've cut down on some, but my roommate got me a very nice one. Shout out. I won't bring it up just to, uh, I don't want to, you know, annoy the people of Spotify or the audio only experience without being seen or without being able to see my amazing uh, present. Also got an avocado tree going pretty well. We'll see how that turns out. If anyone has any tips for keeping avocados alive, please let me know. Because And Boston ferns too. Mine are... I mean, it's it's battling. I used to have it up here because it's so much nicer having a little fern on your desk. It's the best. But then it just dies because we're living in a bunker, which we have... Uh, we've covered pretty well here on the Fairly Lame Podcast. And then so our final story for today here on the Fairly Lame Podcast... So CRISPR gene editing cuts tree flowering times from a decade to mere months. Is this playing God? Could this be scary? I don't know. Is this is this moving into GMO? I guess it is. I guess CRISPR is genetically modified organisms. So I'm sure that has its own uh, connotations. So selectively breeding of plants can give them new beneficial traits, but trees have a frustratingly long reproductive cycle. Now scientists at the University of Georgia have used CRISPR gene editing to make popular trees flower within months rather than a decade. So a bit of background information on what CRISPR is. So CRISPR is a technology that can be used to edit genes uh, and as such, will likely change the world. The essence of CRISPR is simple. It's a way of finding a specific bit of DNA inside a cell. After that, the next step in CRISPR gene editing is to usually alter that piece of DNA. However, CRISPR has also been adapted to do other things, such as turning genes off or on without altering their sequence. And so the old DNA sequence, is you know, it's like ATCG, I think. Yeah, ATCG, and it's like the ladder. It's a double helix of DNA, right? They've got these letters and shit anyway, and they, like, match up. And Anyway, that's a real bad definition of DNA. Anyway, um, so the CRISPR technology also have this, has the potential to transform medicine, enabling us to not only treat but prevent many diseases. We may even decide to use it to change the genomes of our children. An attempt to do this in China has been condemned as premature and unethical. But... Some think it could benefit children in the future. So at the moment, customized CAS proteins have been created that do not cut DNA or alter it in any way, but merely turn genes on or off. So if you turn a gene off, you just won't display that trait. If you turn a gene on, maybe maybe a gene's meant to be turned on. I mean, you'd assume. Actually, I don't want to talk about stuff I don't know because I feel like I do that enough, but you'd assume that surely DNA should be turned on. So maybe... If just for if it's faulty and it's not turned on, then you turn it on. I don't know. Let me know. Any any brain surgeons out there? 
hit me up. Come on the Fairly Lane podcast. So, plant breeding is all about cultivating, boosting, and even creating desirable traits in plants. That can include increasing size, appearance, nutritional value, shout out uh, golden rice, which we'll touch on in a later episode, yield, resistance to pests, and tolerant of heat, cold, salinity, or drought. Usually involves selecting and crossbreeding individual plants with these traits, but that of course requires waiting for plants to mature. In many cases, that's fine. The reproductive cycle of vegetable plants, for instance, is a matter of months. So there's a fairly quick turnaround to see if experiments are working. But for trees, it's a different matter. It can take several years to see the sometimes literal fruits of labor. So in a new study, the Georgia researchers turned the uh, turned to the CRISPR gene editing system to try to speed things up. Their target was the poplar, a tree that has a long juvenile period that can take seven to 10 years before it begins to flower. Obviously, that's a long time to wait to check if a crossbred was successful. So using CRISPR to edit a flowering suppressor gene, we are able to compress the flowering time from more than seven years to three to four months. And the year-long floral organ development period has been cut down to just a few days. And then down the bottom here, they had a nice part that, you know, being a sufferer of hay fever, a bad sufferer, I can never work outside in summer, honestly. Even sometimes just driving around. Golf especially, the worst hay fever you'll ever get. But... This technology provides a molecular a molecular basis for developing hairless seeds, which could reduce allergen spread in urban areas or across working forests. There you go. That's not bad at all. That's a bit sciencey. That's a bit plain God. I don't know. Let me know down below what your thoughts on this whole, you know, genetically modified organisms are. I'm a bit on the fence. I do see, you know, you can't go around changing everything, but... Uh, Actually, no, I won't say that. I was going to say something about animal agriculture, about how we've manipulated a lot of those species. For example, sheep. Sheep can't survive on their own because they've been not genetically altered, but they've been uh, selectively bred to have to be sheared now because they they used to just molt their wool, but now they have to be sheared or shorn. Sheared, I guess. Uh, And so that's an example, but that like that's obviously not right. So I assume maybe this isn't right. I don't know. But then in saying that, there's also genetic modification in the fact of uh, the golden rice, which we talked about. They're also bringing out a couple strains. Golden rice is to just help address vitamin A deficiency, which can lead to blinding uh, in children especially, I believe. And then they're also bringing out some strains of rice, which are higher in iron and zinc as well. And so that seems like a very noble cause. So maybe there's just certain initiatives where genetically modified organisms is more acceptable. Is research one of those? I don't know. I personally, I think it's interesting. I mean, if a tree needs to, I guess it depends on the outcome. Um, yeah. And then I guess if it's, if it gets out into the wild, like if these, if these plants somehow get planted in the wild or they escape treatment, if they're doing, you know, field tests, and then somehow some of these trees escape, some of their saplings escape, whatever. Maybe that's a whole nother story. I don't know. Like I said, please let me down. Uh, let me know down in the comments below. But yeah, this has been uh, a- another great episode of the Fairly Lame Podcast. We're trying to keep it a bit shorter now. Not as much rambling. Um, just, you know, get a nice chunk of news out. So, you know, if you're driving to the gym in the morning, get a nice 20, 30 minutes of news. Know what's going on in the world. Feel good and a great way to start your day. Please make sure to follow over on Instagram and TikTok and subscribe on YouTube at fairly lame underscore. We post my top news stories from the day as a bit of a carousel post, as well as a deep dive in articles uh, each and every day, clips from the podcast, all that incredible stuff. And share a whole bunch of wholesome animal content on our stories too, might I add. But yeah, hopefully you have an incredible time or had an incredible time over the New Year's Eve and Christmas period. We'll talk to you next week, next Monday, 3 p.m. Have a great day. Lots of love here from the Fairly Lame Studios. See you guys.